presentations for general purposes. And um, so it, um, if you have a really um, big problem with a, a dog, we ask that you um, consult with a professional canine behaviorist or a behaviorist uh, that is a veterinarian. That's your best bet if you have con continuing behavioral issues with your Scotty. And at the end of this session is a resource section that um, has uh, guidance on how to choose a trainer. And Lori, I'm just going to interject the, with one other one other comment. Um, I are, we sure. are recording this session, so if you do not want your photo to be part of the thing that people see, please go ahead and stop your video. And by being present, um, that just uh, gives us permission to include you in the recording. Okay, thank you. Great. Great. The title of the, this presentation is Working and Living with Leash Reactive Scotties. And my name is Lori. Uh, this is presented in loving memory of Tobias Wolf Keenan, who was, um, as we'll see, the poster boy for this uh, Zoomie. My disclaimer is that I am not a practicing professional. Um, I, for most of my career was either a college teacher. Um, I have a PhD in uh, classical studies, which is ancient Greek and Latin. Um, and I also uh, for 17 years was an editor at an academic pub publishing company. My first and best teachers were the 10 Scotties with whom I've shared my life since 1979. Most of them were rescues. Three of them had challenging behavioral issues. I have taken, I stopped counting when I was trying to figure this at 23, um, more than 23 in-person seminars, ranging from four hours to five days each from a number of really amazing teachers. And I'll mention these. And there is a resource section at the end for books, articles, products, and programs that I recommend. My Scotties, were my best teachers. Um, and these, you will be hearing a little bit about each one of them, mostly about, um, about Toby. I've had 43 years of living with these Scotties and that will teach you a lot. I've had from one to three Scotties at a time. And as I said, all but one of them were rescued or rehomed. My human teachers are many. And I am so, so grateful to them. Um, I went from being a totally, utterly clueless first time Scotty owner. Um, I bought my first Scotty in a pet shop back in 1979 when we didn't know that that wasn't a good thing to do. To it, I then became a, what I'd say is a more knowledgeable Scotty owner. I have made plenty of mistakes and I have the scars and regrets to prove it. So these are the professionals who helped teach me <coughs> over many years. And if they have an asterisk after their name, it indicates <coughs> that you can find them on the web if you Google them. First of all is Suzanne Clothier and you'll be hearing her name a lot. I've taken probably 15 seminars from her. And um, she really taught me how to have a constant connection with my dogs. Um, Cher Seawick is our holistic vet. And she is an amazing, amazing person. If you have access to a, a, a vet with an integrative, um, integrative uh, pro, um, program, I would highly suggest doing it. A holistic vet takes more time with you. And what she did is taught me to observe my Scotties. And also she introduced me to nutrition and body work um, that helped in with behavioral problems too. Third is Dr. Joanne Carson, who was the owner um, of the canine epilepsy list that I served on as a mentor for a 10 or more years. Joanne also taught uh, me to observe and also how to calm a dog who was 
um, having issues with anxiety because many and and also epileptic dogs have high sensitivities to environmental stimulus. Dr. Temple Grandin, you may know, she is um, an, uh, a person on the um, autistic spectrum and amazing person and um, taught oh, basically about stimulus overload, which is a, an issue for, for very many um, autistic people and also for certain of other people, not on the spectrum, but dogs too. Dr. Karen, overall, I took an amazing three-day seminar from her that was, boy, talk about uh, information overload. She's a behaviorist. She also may stress the human component in behavioral problems. Uh, Staff and Wolves at Wolf Park in Indiana. Uh, this is me with Wotan. We had a three-day seminar where we were um, in with the wolves, uh, up the pack of wolves that reside at Wolf Park, an amazing, amazing experience in learning about canine behavior. Dr. Sig P. Hansen, who is our Scots chiropractor, he taught me the importance of having um, a body that's stable for the Scots. Um, I eventually had every single one of my Scots see them, see him, and they would line up to be able to have their chance under Sig's hand. <coughs> Dr. Jean Dodds was another a consultant on the canine epilepsy list, and she, <coughs> excuse me, she taught me about um, the connection between nutrition and health, specifically thyroid and behavior. I took one, one day seminar. I I've taken seminars with Dr. Dodds too. Um, Dr. Ian Dunbar, who is the uh, behaviorist who introduced the canine world really to classical conditioning, and we'll talk about this, and bite assessment, and we'll talk about that. Finally, Claudine McAuliffe, who um, I, is still has a presence on the web. She is in Wisconsin. I took a number of seminars with her on nutrition and also body work. I um, learned Tellington T touch uh, from her. What all of my human teachers had in common was they changed the way I live with my Scotties. And I am so grateful to all of them. First of all, let's talk about reactivity in Scotties. Is this a breed thing? Um, when I first got my, my first Scotty, I would have people say, oh, I was bitten by a Scotty. Um, <clears throat> My first dog trainer, when Hannah was my first Scotty, was the last one in the class to be willing to go down on command, said, well, you wanted a Scotty and now you have one. Um, a young woman who came into our, uh, to the Chicago Scotty Club uh, had her first ever dog and it was a Scotty and her vet remarked to her, this is not exactly a starter dog. Um, Scotties are naturally spunky and hardwired. They're bred for killing. They were bred for killing vermin. They have very fast reaction times. They're courageous. They're scrappy. They're willing to rumble. Um, Scotties play hard. Uh, there's an old Irish set it, uh, saying, is this a private fight or can anyone join in? And every Scotty I've ever had, or almost every one of them has lived by that creed. Um, they have very high energy, high intelligence. One of my friends who did rescue said, my first criterion is that the adoptee, adopter is at least as smart as the Scotty. They are opinionated. In short, they are feisty ratters. When you're handling a Scotty, you're driving a Porsche, not the family van. But do not mistake a typey Scotty for a reactive dog. Typey in all of those things that they naturally are. 
Um, Suzanne Clothier on her website has a free article called Reality Check, and there's a, a link to that there. Um, I, I highly recommend you read this, but also she has loads of free articles. Finally, Temple Grandin in her three-day seminar tells a story about what she called an exploding pig. She evaluates temperament in farm animals um, and she goes around and, and um, looks at them. And what she did with pigs, which she would take a, uh, her hand and rattle the um, enclosure. And she said, at a certain point when farmers were breeding what they call lean line pigs, you know, pork, the new white meat kind of thing, um, the pigs would, what she said, what she called explode. They would actually attack the um, place where she had rattled the enclosure. And she said that she told these farmers, you have a problem. You have bred these to be very lean. They have high musculature and therefore their temperament is going the way of exploding behavior. Uh, and this is because it's like, a, you know, someone who's on steroids, if you are lean, you are, you have um, higher cortisol level. So I just wonder about um, our choices in breeding Scotties, if it hasn't resulted in a little bit more muscular be, um, bodies, and perhaps a temperament that goes along with that. Just a question. Levels of reactivity in my Scotties. Now this, you know, I'm, I just created this scale out of my own Scotties. Um, they went from highly reactive to easy peasy and through sheer dumb luck. My first two Scotties were dream easy. They were in fact starter dogs. This was Hannah who was amiable with other dogs. According to my first dog trainer, she suckered me into the breed. <laughs> um, Beth was my second Scotty and she was basically oblivious to everyone and everything except at balls and squeaky toys. That was her whole world. So how lucky was I? When I took Bet in f at first, she was a foster dog, but uh, eventually she came back to me. I drove over to the person who had found her on the street, and we were trying to locate the owner and uh, ultimately did. And I had agreed to take her in. I had Hannah in the car. I left Hannah in the car because the person had uh, another dog. I was at least not that dumb. But I looked, went and met Bet, thought it was fine. I then brought her down to the car and stuck her in the back seat with Hannah. How stupid is that? Do not try this at home. They were fine together. Bet ignored Hannah. Hannah was affable. And so I was lucky. I was lucky also because my most reactive Scotty was Toby, who was number eight. And this is where we will begin. This is Tob. <laughs> this is Tobe. Um, he was a constant challenge and there was a high potential for danger with him. As I said, he was my number eight Scotty and my number one teacher. We adopted him in August of 2010 at age four or five. He left this earth uh, in November of 2018. Toby was rescued from a hoarding horror situation along with 13 other Scotties. There were more dogs who were Cocker Spaniels and mixes, um, 30 some dogs in one house, all living at large on the second floor. There was starvation, filth, dog fights, and documented abuse by one, uh, at least one of the humans who had, um, who, who owned these dogs. He is, as I said, the Zoomies poster boy. He was scarily reactive to all other dogs and humans outside of his pack. And I only discovered this after I got him home because, you know, he was shut down when, when uh, I went to pick him up along with probably every other Scotty who was there. 
the vein, the example of when I found out he was reactive is our neighbor, Howie, who was a lovely older hippie guy, um, had known that I was getting a foster dog um, and he saw us and took, he was about 20 yards away from us, took one step towards us saying, oh, is that your new little rescue guy? And Toby went up like a rocket. I've never seen anything like it. He was eye high on me. Uh, he, that's how far up he went. And he was growling, froth, fresh, lunging in midair, frothing. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen a dog do. Um, Howie's wife said, who was standing farther away said, it was like something out of Cirque du Soleil <laughs> because he just launched himself. But Toby was also sweet, loving and loyal to every uh, one of us in his pack. And there were two other dogs in his pack at that time. Second level is situationally reactive. And this is two, not, not surprisingly, two females, Emma and Maddie. These girls were an occasional challenge with a potential for danger. Emma was my third Scotty and Maddie was number seven. They were tough, possessive, judgmental, uh, stealth attack bitches who would occasionally fight and bite with what I thought was a little warning outside and inside the home. We had dog fights inside our home because of possessiveness. Emma was had zero early socialization in her first home. She was on the lap of an old elderly woman all the time. She didn't even know how to be on the floor like uh, most dogs ever on the floor. She was terrified of any, everything when we adopted her. She was a, a, afraid of the wind, um, garbage cans, um, every other human except for me. She was jealous and possessive once she came out of that. She was highly opinionated. She did not like certain people and certain other dogs. She certainly did not suffer fools. She was very intelligent, but a handful. Maddie was a stray from Chicago Animal Control. She came in starving, filthy. She'd been living in a dog pack with a homeless person in an empty abandoned building. Maddie was our urban street fighter. She was also an incredible hunter. She was wary of closed spaces. She was hypersensitive to movement. Again, she was a foster uh, who came back to us. She um, was placed with a family um, who had a young daughter who was a ballerina and she did not like the fast movement of the young woman and she started out growling they ignored that and eventually she nipped her she was also jealous and very possessive and jealousy and possessiveness is uh, more often a trait of dogs who are anxious um, or fearful then a confident dog will not be as normally as jealous and possessive Next level is sensitive and anxious or anxious. This is Sadie on the left, Teddy in the middle, and Hemingway, who we also called Hemi, on the, on the right. These are dogs who are easily overwhelmed by stimuli, stimuli but have posed little or no danger potential. These dogs were more a problem to themselves than to others. Sadie was number four, Teddy was number five, and Hemi, Hemi was number nine. All three were highly sensitive to environmental stimuli. Uh, Sadie was undone by auditory and visual stimuli. She was almost euthanized by the shelter who she came into because of an uh, and quote, incurable ear infection, which our vet was able to address, but may have been part of her increased sensitivity. She rocked and moaned when she was overwhelmed and overwhelmed. And um, Temple Grandin, when I talked with her about it, said, this is a high level of dis disorders of stimulus sensitivity. And she suggested she was comparable to um, 
autistic people who are, as uh, Dr. Grandin says, most often uh, diagnosed because of a meltdown they've had in a big box store. Too much stimulation. Teddy was, uh, when we adopted him from rescue, nearly cat catatonic. Any movement or sound would terrify him. He was epileptic, not properly medicated for years before rescue, and he was kept in a crate 24-7. He was, he was shell-shocked what he was. Hemi um, barked nonstop at other dogs when we first uh, adopted him until he got up close to them and then he just sort of ignored them. We later realized when there was no other dog in the house that he could follow um, their lead, he was hearing impaired, pretty badly hearing impaired. He heard only certain noises. He could hear whistles, um, but the noises he would hear outside, I think, made him anxious, like sirens. He also was overly stimulated by food and he would lose fine motor control of his body and bang into the other dogs, which got him in a lot of trouble, especially with Maddie. Finally, the three uh, that were affable, docile, and essentially har harmless, Hannah in the middle is Duncan and Nessa's on the right, who is our current dog. Hannah was the first one. Jim calls her Hannah of sainted memory. Jim is my husband because of the way I talk about her. Duncan is number six, and Nessa was number 10, our current dog. These are deeply sweet marshmallow dogs who could tend towards submissiveness. And with this kind of Scotty, you need to protect them from obnoxious or inappropriate dogs and humans. Finally is Bet, who, as I told you, was oblivious. She was our second study, truly self-absorbed, ignored other dogs and people unless the dog or person had a ball or a squeaky toy and was willing to throw it for hours. It took her three months, for example, to realize I had a cat. Um, she would have let a squirrel run up the bridge of her nose. She, her prey drive was all aimed at balls and squeaky toys. She was vision impaired, which might have had something to do with this. This was when we adopted her. She had um, untreated dry eye and crumbling corneas. So how much improvement can you expect? This Zoomy concentrates on dogs who react inappropriately um, when on leash in the presence of relatively unoffending other dogs or humans. But there's also a lot here for working with dogs who are at all of the other levels. How much improvement can you expect? It depends. Is it a matter of training alone? This is, a, is this a dog who simply needs to learn social skills and build their confidence? Or was there deprivation or harm and now trauma with its anxiety, resulting anxiety and fear? If there was harm, how deep or long and long war did the Scotty endure? For Toby, it was four to five years. That's a long time. How willing or able are you to spend a lot of time working with your Scotty? If you're willing to do a lot of work, you get more improvement. How long do you actually have with the Scotty? You may run out of time if it's an older dog or if you're older like I am now. Um, and the example we'll see at the end of the presentation is the pro progress that Toby was able to make and his limitations. Big question is why are dogs reactive on leash? Some dogs, but not all, are only reactive on leash. Toby was reactive both ways. Suzanne Clothier thinks that if your dog is only reactive on leash, there's a human component there. But there's, there are other things. On leash, they are essentially trapped. They're unable to escape what makes them fearful or anxious. So fight is the only option. Flight option has been removed. Um, counter example is Toby's first night. Inside the house, once we'd done the long drawn out um, uh, introductions to the other dogs, he tried to get up on this chair with Maddie. She snapped at his face and he ran all the way to the back of the apartment. 
apartment. <laughs> and I said to him, good boy, he had the option of flight. He wasn't going to fight. He never wanted to fight, I think. Could be a, a factor also of insufficient early socialization. And this is why we love our good readers. Um, the dog can be insecure, afraid, or uncertain how to read other dogs and people. These dogs need gentle skills training in a class setting if that's tolerable for them. Can also be a factor of territoriality or possessiveness of the owner or of certain objects. There are more incidents of reactivity near the home in the presence of the owner or food or toys. The human handler also may be misleading or overstimulating the dog. If there is tension constantly on the leash, you're letting the dog pull. Um, if there are corrections or punishment, which there is really uh, not an excuse for, um, anxiety or uncertainty about handling situations. Um, if the owner is anxious, the dog will be anxious. There may be physical or medical conditions like an old arthritic dog who or dog who has an abscess tooth. Um, this can cause a lot of problems because they don't wanna be approached. If they have hearing or vision impairment, it makes them hard to anticipate acts or, or of other people or of people or other dogs. And this can make them barky or reactive like Hemingway was. They may be reading fear or concern or disapproval off the owner. And I have a uh, example of this. I could not figure out why Maddie um, reacted badly every time the gate, I thought every time the gate of the apartment building next door, big metal gate was slammed. And I asked Suzanne because I couldn't really anticipate I'd come out, somebody would be going through, slam, slam the gate and she'd go off. And Suzanne asked, asked me, is it whenever anyone goes through the gate? And I thought about it and I said, no, actually it's only when the domestic abuser next door goes through the gate. Now he, we had called the police on this person several times and I did not like him obviously and she said do we have a problem with the domestic abuser next door busted she was reading it off of me question about whether or not this is reactivity or aggression and how serious is your Scotty's case and right now we have to pause just a second and say that you need to be aware that labels can be what Clothier called sticky. If you label a dog shy, reactive, aggressive, whatever, anxious, that label can stick and it can make you unable to see a different thing future for the dog. So just be aware of that. This Brian Andresen um, illustration says the only thing that separates from me from the animals is a lot of words. So when I'm not talking much, the gap closes really quick. So don't tell yourself a story. Oh, this is a rescue. He was abused. All of those things may be true, but what matters is what the dog is experiencing now and how you can help him. There is a confusion about reactivity and aggression most because most reactivity consists of a display that humans deem aggressive or violent. Um, most aggression in dogs is fear or anxiety based. It is an attempt to avoid actual conflict. So that's not an, really an aggressive dog like Toby running to the back of the apartment. Didn't want a conflict. You also, as I said, need to rule out pain, especially in older dogs and disabilities like vision, vision and hearing impairment. You need to cushion your dog against the fear and increase their confidence and social skills through training. If after time, your Scotty is still showing little or no improvement when you've taken all of this into consideration, it may be a bigger problem than reactivity. 
big question is, is your Scotty a biter? And if so, how serious or consistent a biter does your Scotty have any or some bite inhibition? For this, I'm not I'm just gonna go through this quickly. Dr. Ian Dunbar's bite scale, you can just uh, Google that, uh, but the links are below, is, is very important. It goes from level one with that is obnoxious or aggressive behavior, but no skin contact by the teeth to level six, victim dead. It can be very serious. And Dunbar is very good at parsing out all of the levels and letting you know how much damage your dog does, what, what kind of attack, the higher up an attack goes on the body, the more serious it is, uh, that sort of thing. So check that out. He also has a fight bite ratio, a dog who um, has had a lot of fights, but no biting is not as dangerous as a dog who has had three fights and bit every time. So these are things to take into consideration. Continuing on with reactivity and, or aggression, um, you need to assess and be realistic about how dangerous your Scotty is. Yes, that is a Scotty bat. Um, and act to avoid consequences somebody getting hurt. At the same time, you need to recognize the context of a low-level bite that happens out of fear or pain. Our my very first dog trainer, Dennis, said, I can, to the class, I can put your dog in a situation where she or he will happily bite you. An example of this is my father had a hunting dog, a Weimaraner named Rex, and Rex was an excellent hunter. Um, he got caught up in a barbed wire fence. My father tried to extract him from the fence and Rex bit him. Not the dog's fault. And the warning is that your own reactive Scotty may bite you. This is called redirected aggression. Um, if their fear level exceeds their threshold. And this happened to my husband, Jim. He was going out of our apartment building. We're in a three, three flat condo uh, in a, our small vestibule. Saw our neighbor who had an Irish setter about to come in and he said, oh, just wait, Ken, let me pull the door. And he pulled the door so that he and Toby were behind the door, heavy oak and glass door. They had picked up Toby thinking this would be okay. And Toby was so upset that he bit Jim on the hand pretty badly. So our goals here are to manage the reactivity while increasing the sense of safety, increasing social skills, building confidence, and keeping everyone safe. The ideal is to train to a more stable status quo along with gentle, gradual socialization to produce fewer or no more in incidents of reactivity, but realize that management always fails. And this is a quote from Clothier. You can be distracted or forget what to pay attention. And I had a very bad dog fight happen between Maddie and our gentle little Sadie when I was coming in from the outside uh, with Sadie. And normally I would have been aware of Maddie and I could call her off uh, with my voice, but I was tired. I'd just gone to an exercise class. I was distracted. And she, the minute we got inside the door, she went after Sadie. This is another thing that I was uh, introduced to by Suzanne Clothier, but Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, which explain, explains why a sense of safety is crucial. Down at the bottom of this triangle are physiological needs, like survival, food, water, shelter, medical care, and safety, which are the base two tiers upon which all other things um, rest. You can't train a dog who doesn't have safety and their physiological needs met. The upper tiers are minimally or not at all accessible if the food first two are not reliably available. This was constructed for humans, but it, uh, it applies, I don't know if any of us get to transcendence, but it applies to dogs as well. What a sense of threat does to mammalian physiology. 
yeah, there's a little uh, hyped up Braveheart Scotty. Threats can cause a rise in stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. Constant stress leads to a higher set point of stress hormones. Adrenaline comes on quickly, anticipates quickly. Cortisol takes longer to dissipate and your body can reset the level of cortisol it has if you are constantly under stress. The effects of high levels of cortisol, and you see this in people with PTSD, they are on a fight or flight kind of thing. Either they shut down or they come at you. They make rapid black and white decisions. I always say stress makes you stupid because things like the larger picture, that's just not available to you anymore. You can lose small motor control because your body is just so hyped up. For example, to try to thread a needle when you're upset or how long does it take you to calm down after almost being in a car accident? You're pretty jittery. You're not in a good shape or a good place. There are also environmental stressors and sensitivities. Um, and if you look at these and think about that you're a prey animal in maybe the jungle and sensing, trying to sense whether predators are nearby. Changes in light or having light too bright. This is what they do to torture people who leave the light, bright lights on all the time. Or is the light deficient and you can't see? Or is it modulating, which means something's near you? Movement. Um, any kind of movement, whether directly coming towards you or in your peripheral vision, think of how easily you can be startled if you don't know somebody's coming into a room and you're not paying attention. And poor little Duncan um, was so afraid of fast movement that even after we'd had him for years, if we approached him really quickly, he would roll over on his back and urinate himself. Sound is also an issue, sudden sounds, the level of sound. Our Sadie was, uh, had a bad reaction to certain TV shows where the, there was a lot of yelling and things like that. She'd start rocking and moaning. And there may be great individual variants in reaction to environmental stressors. stressors. You need to assess your Scotty's sensitivity to stressors and moderate their exposure to them accordingly. So the first step is to keep your Scotty safe and calm in your Scotty's terms, not your terms. What makes you feel calm is, or what you're aware of that makes you feel calm. It may not be enough for your Scotty. This is good for all Scotties, regardless what level they're at. It allows you to build a better Scotty, one that is easier to train in social skills and to build their confidence. You should consider learning to do or scheduling body work. And I've had resources for this. I learned how to do Tellington T-Touch and wraps. I took a massage class. I took several Reiki classes and I took my Scotties for chiropractic adjustment. That was Dr. Sig. Um, so there are resources listed for that. You need to reset your Scotty's expectations that interactions bring good things like treats, general, general interaction, and um, praise and toys. And the ultimate goal is to minimize exposure to stress that causes a rise in cortisol. Allow the cortisol to reset to a new and lower base level, which takes time and consistency. There's my... Nessa over at the right, keep a calm and safe home environment. You want order, predictability, and control. Moderate any interfamilial psychodrama you may have, fights, whatever, stress, or move your Scotty to a quiet spot during stressful times. Establish a regular schedule for feeding, walking, bedtimes. Oh, how dogs love regular schedules. Don't let your Scotty practice being jacked up. And this was um, what Jody Herga Andresen did in the re her reactivity Zoomy. She talked about uh, 
getting rid of towers of powers like a, a window perch where your dog will start barking at everything don't allow them to police behaviors like fences doors and windows and then even if you have to block them off and jody i you can access still her reactivity zoomy and i think i've got a, a resource item on that great great um zoomy Feed your Scotty separately, have them sleep slept separately if it is needed. Emma was a food marauder and we had to um, gate her off from everyone else. She would bolt her food and come and try to take the other dog's foods, food. And the only way really to stop her was to gate her separately because otherwise the other dogs would suffer stress. Um, think of, you know, you're trying to eat and somebody's trying to grab your plate. Maddie also, um, we had at one point to crate her at night because being a street dog, she, if jostled in the middle of the night, she would fight before she was even awake. So do what you have to do in that uh, term, those terms. Your Scotty does not need to be a part of every single one of your social engagements. You need to assess what they enjoy and can handle versus what is too much. Um, even non-reactive dogs can, can snarl and snap at holidays. Um, they're overwhelmed. Too many people, too much activity, too much going on. They're getting no rest. Um, Toby also, we had to be very careful with him around guests. Need to kind of cushion your Scotty from a frenetic outside environment. Um, we live in a dense north side neighborhood with everything you can imagine, even helicopters overhead, news helicopters. So there is a lot going on, or inch pedestrian tra traffic, people appearing suddenly from doorways, etc. So you need to assess what is safe and secure for you, as opposed to what is safe and secure for, for your Scotty. I am inured to all of the sound now. I'm not aware of the effect it has on me. And, and, uh, but I, when we first get Scotties who've been in quieter environments, it's pretty obvious uh, that this environment can be stressful. You need to um, anticipate what your Scotty is going to do and structure your walks accordingly. Go during um, times that are not so um, frenetic. And there are some examples, I'm not gonna go through these um, of things I noticed in my Scotties. So walk your Scotty at the calmest, most quiet, least populated times of the day. We call this low tide here, especially when you are trying to work with them. Shorten walk times if they absolutely need to go out at busy or noisy times or if they become stressed for any reason. Make use of a fenced in yard if you have one to provide a calm space. We had to do this for Ted. We called it taking him deep yard away from the street uh, because otherwise he, at first he could not eliminate if he was out on the street. And monitor in person the behavior in the yard. Otherwise other dogs can appear from nowhere, blah, blah, blah. While you're still working with your reactive Scotty, walk them alone, not with your other dogs. You need all your focus on them. Factors of reactivity, this is what Clothier called her stimulus gradient, distance, duration, and intensity. How far away is the stimulus before your Scotty reacts? How long can your Scotty endure the presence of a stimulus? And how does the energy level or action or reaction of the other dog or person affect your Scotty? These are on a sliding scale and you have to adjust them as needed. Which factors or combinations um, cause your Scotty problems. So you need to anticipate so that you can interrupt and redirect your Scotty before you get a big reaction. These are um, Turid Rugos's calming signals and I'm only going to mention, if you look at these, you'll see me mention these a little bit um, as we're assessing. 
these are not written in stone, but these are ways that dogs react to the presence of stress. And they can either do it themselves or they do it in order to calm down another dog. Um, stepping between is a big one. Uh, walking slowly, yawning, licking your lips, uh, lying down, uh, sitting down, lifting one paw. We'll, walk, we'll go up and talk about some of these. This is the way you can anticipate what your dog is going to do, and you have to be connected with them at all times and reward them with happy talk, praise, treats, toys, and, and so forth as you're connected with them, from thanking them for making their maintaining a connection with you. Um, Observe your Scotties and the other dog's posture and demeanor, and these signs work together below. One of them all in isolation, really, you can't predict what it means. You need to observe their muscle tension. Are they soft and swooshy or hard like this cement statue at left? Um, what about their torso movement? Are they wiggly, curvy, or are they stock still or super slow in their movement? That could be stalking. What about the gait? Is it loose and goofy? Or is it like a little tin soldier or goose step or jerky? That means loss of motor control. Are they breathing or are they not breathing? This is hard to see on a Scotty. Um, but are the eyes soft and liquidy, blinking? Or are they set like BBs, steely looking and not, and not or infrequently blinking? Is the mouth relaxed or does it, is it in a closed line? Hard to see in a Scotty, but the set of the beard sometimes gives you, uh, if it's the beard's going out at the side, that might mean the dog has um, its mouth closed and pursed. Spatial orientation, are they facing sideways to the target or perhaps seemingly ignoring it or are they squared off? If some, they're squaring off against something, you, you're about to have a problem. The tail is hard to read, at least for me. Are they wagging excitedly or in big loops or are they moving it more slowly side to slide, which means wariness or stiffly, which means fear um, or not wagging at all or is it tough and stiff or stiff upright and still. All of those are can be um, warning signs. It position of the ears, are they upright and confidently alert or, or softly to the side? Or are they pasted back or airplane, which means fear, or moving up and down? And again, these the ear all by itself means nothing. You have to look at the rest of the picture. For the paws, are they all four on the floor, standing confidently? Or is one paw raised? That's a calming signal. Can it uh, indicate uncertainty or anxiety? need to anticipate by being aware of potential danger zones also. I love this New Yorker cover with the beware of dog in the tree. I put in the red arrow. Potential danger zones are intersections, especially when they're blind, doorways, fence lines that resident dogs patrol, parked cars that can contain people or other dogs. If your Scotty's attention is drawn somewhere, look like Dr. Bailey says in Grey's Anatomy, when I move, you move. Well, when your Scotty looks, you look. Test your Scotty's comfort level with treats and pleasant distractions. If you think something may be up, in other words, before they react, is your Scotty snapping or biting at your fingers when taking a treat? That means loss of fine motor control, or won't they take the treat at all? Can they not be distracted by something they normally enjoy? This tells you your dog or is or is not in what Clothier calls the think and learn zone. So you're trying to interrupt and just redirect before you get a big reaction. How do you interrupt? Turn and walk away at an angle if possible. We always cross the street with Toby if we could. Put something physical between you and your... Uh, your Scotty and the target stepping between is that calming signal I mentioned. F put first put yourself not but not squared off against the target between your Scotty and the target, and then also a parked car or building or tree. We use parked cars extensively. Fortunately, we have a fairly quiet street as far as traffic goes. This is hard to do if you've turned your back and walked straight away instead of at an angle. You want to be at an angle if you can, so you can put yourself between 
without having your back turned. Speak calmly and smoothly, not in a choppy staccato, and in an upbeat manner as you are moving away. Redirect your Scotty's attention to something positive. That poor toy, I'm not even sure what it was. Your, yourself is a is something, a toy or stick if your dog likes sticks. Keywords, bunny, squirrel, tree, toy, um, and, and so forth. Walk, yard. This is a way of using the power of classical conditioning, pairing something positive with something mildly disconcerting. You're pairing something positive with the, your dog just saw the target. And um, if you, this is classical conditioning is that, pairing those two things. Think of your workplace and the check. You may not enjoy your job, but boy, you'll do it because that paycheck is coming. Reactive dog classes use this, uh, use classical conditioning. They check, have a check-in and treat. If your dog is willing to distract himself from the target, they get a cookie. Ian Dunbar's claim was in the class that I took with him, classical conditioning is only effective 100% of the time in all situations. And don't be afraid that comforting or rewarding a fearful or anxious dog is reinforcing the fear. This used to be believed by trainers. It is not true. You are not making them think, oh, she likes it when I tremble like this. You, comforting your dog is the humane thing to do. If you fail to anticipate and, interact and redirect protect yourself, your Scotty, and everybody else. Verbally and clearly ask the other dog's owner or the person alone to move away. Have it calmly but firmly. My dog is reactive, please don't come any closer. My dog is nervous and needs space, space please don't approach. Continue to put as much distance as possible at an angle if possible. Put physical barriers, including yourself, between your Scotty and the target. Don't be tempted to pick up your Scotty. Um, don't get bitten. If they, you can't avoid a target that is nearing too fast for your dogs to come. This is Jim's, what happened with Jim and Toby. Instead, keep moving away if possible while warning the person with the other dog not to come near. Remove your reactive Scotty to a calm and predictable environment as soon as you can and expect that it may take your Scotty some time before they are out of the reactive mode. Question is, is this just you or is it your Scotty? Is it just your Scotty or is it you? And I'm guilty as anybody here. You have to be keep yourself calm and aware in a tense situation. You have to practice this by your body posture and facial expressions. Your Scotty will read you to confirm fears and will read your assessment of the situation and the stimulus. Your Scotty can read you easily. Think of how hard it is to at bath time or pill time. They know what you're going to do. Check in on yourself. And basically this is sort of what you want to check in on your Scotty. Have a relaxed vigilance to your posture, your shoulders down, your muscles loose. Your facial expression should be uh, your mouth slightly open and slack, not in a pursed line. And Clothier uh, suggests you put your tongue in front of your teeth. <laughs> and that will make you look stupid, but it will also make you, to your dog, look react, look re relaxed. Your voice should be slow, drawn out, soft, not staccato or loud. Mammals are high, hardwired to react to voice quality. Baby mammals will all react the same to eh, 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 or, oh, that's so nice. Keep breathing and blinking. It is appalling how quickly we stop breathing and blinking when we're under stress. Keep tension slack on the leash. Don't full face towards the stimulus. Put one shoulder towards the stimulus, which is again a calming signal. And without facing off, position yourself, walk between, step between your Scotty and the stimulus. 
Um, Toby used this often to protect Maddie when she was old and feeble from Hemingway who would gyrate around when the food, it was food time. He would just step between Hemingway and Maddie, just step between, and it would calm Hemingway down sometimes at least. In less stressful or more static situations, Google relaxation protocols, they are, can help you convey calm. Um, Karen Overall and Suzanne Clothier both have protocols. One quick example is don't sit on the edge of your seat when you're at the vet's office. It conveys that you're anticipating lean back and slump even. Nessa, I used to, I couldn't understand why Nessa would not come up on the couch when I pat because I knew she wanted to, she'd be standing there wanting to come up on the couch. And it was because I was sitting on the edge. If I lean back, she pops up on the couch really fast. She was anticipating that I was getting up or something. So she was reading me. Maybe it's the other dog or human that is the problem. Don't let a dog test your Scotty's temperament, even if your Scotty is not normally reactive. Same goes for humans and especially children. Don't let your Scotty socialize with clueless individuals who may sometimes inadvertently annoy or make your Scotty anxious or fearful. Every dog has individual needs for personal space. It's like this need is likely larger when they're on leash and it varies by dog breeds. We all know Scotty's like their space. They have individual likes and dislikes. Uh, there's a quote from, I believe it's um, King Lear, his countenance likes me not. Sometimes you just don't like people and your Scotty has the right not to like certain people or certain dogs. This applies both to other dogs and to humans. Uh, Emma, for example, did not like my friend Dee, who's a small Italian woman with a big presence. And she would lean towards Dee like she was trying to bite her. Dogs have individual limits to accept, acceptance of various other dogs' behavior. Nessa, for example, is very tolerant of a four-month-old puppy in our neighborhood named Theo, who's a little, he's, she, she's, he, she's very good with, with her um, playing, but she's sometimes a little over rough, Theo is. But Nessa doesn't take offense at that. Assess whether your Scotty wants to greet a dog or another human. If there's no show of active eagerness on both sides, skip it. Maybe it's the other dog um, continued here. Don't let other dogs push your Scotty's buttons. We don't really understand all of dog to dog communication. Another dog may be dissing your Scotty. You may not be aware of it. We'll leave your Scotty if they want nothing to do with the other dog. Assess the other dogs. Dogs can be rude, obnoxious, poorly socialized, inappropriate, bullying, regardless of what their owner says. Oh, she just wants to play. Oh, he's really friendly. Situationally appropriate canine warning signals, and people are not, some people are not going to like this, like snarling, showing teeth, growling, air snapping, are not reactivity or aggression in the face of an obnoxious other dog. They are your Scotty's appropriate way of saying, back off. Nessa does this with a dog who is right next door, who comes at her like a freight train. Sometimes the owner will drop the leash and this is, Nessa will snap right in the dog's face. And this is um, appropriate given the context. The dog backs off, fortunately. Um, I've had talks with the owner, by the way. This is not permission for your Scotty to be the aggressor, however. That's not the same thing. Intercede on your Scotty's behalf if the Scotty's warning to a rude, pushy, or bullying other dog is ignored by the other dog, or if it just before your Scotty even does anything, intercede and do not punish your Scotty for appropriately warning off another dog. That's telling them, them you don't have their back. Be politely firm with clueless and naive owners. Clothier has a great article called, he just wants to say hi. And I see I'm running late. This is just a, a handout on space etiquette uh, by dogs, for dogs. No, he, the dog isn't being friendly if they're running straight up to you, that's rude. 
And keeping your Scotty, your reactive Scotty calm in special or more static situations at the vet, prearrange that your Scotty, if it's highly reactive, comes into the clinic only after you can go straight to an examination room. And this with COVID now, this is the way it is. No sitting in the waiting room with a reactive Scotty. That's too much to ask. You also might want to bring a sheet with you for the vet to keep with any information you may need to fill out on forms. Um, list of other vets, medical history, medications and supplements, diet, etc. So you don't have to be distracted from monitoring your Scotty and fill out forms only when you are inside the exam room. Work if possible with a veterinary practice that creates a fear-free environment. There, you can just Google that phrase and find out what it is. In larger cities, this is available, um, maybe not in smaller or rural areas. If your vet clinic doesn't provide one, bring along a non-slip mat or cut down yoga mat, works very well, to provide a fear-free standing surface on the examination table. Um, slip and fall is a hardwired mammalian fear. You don't wanna rouse that fear or anxiety. And every time you take your Scotty in, calmly tell or remind the tax and examining vet as needed that your Scotty is reactive and of your Scotty's triggers. Um, put this information on the top of the sheet you give the vet. Use flower essences, calming cap, thunder shirt, Tellington tea touch wrap as needed at the vet. And be liberal with treats, toys, praise, active comfort, just gestures during the experience. At something like Rally, it may be too much for a reactive dog. It was for Toby, was for Hemingway. Even less reactive dogs may need some buffers, keep them in the X-Pen as, as much as you can. If they are calm in the X-Pen, if you need to walk them at Rally, pay attention to distance, duration, intensity, and read your Scotty as you're moving. Position the X-Pen on the perimeter, not in the middle of the actions. Block the view on one side, of uh, on the side of where the action is, and position your chairs between the X-Pen and the main action. Take your Scotty for a big walk before the Rally to release excess energy and remove them. If if, to a calm place, if you see signs of stress, panting, barking, growling, lunging, refusal of treats or water, inability or reluctance to eliminate. Here's our final um, thing, Toby's success story. The happy ending for Toby was that he was able gradually to see another dog across the street, woof, and go back to sniffing. For him, this was a miracle. When we first got him, a block away was too close. He could let calm humans move nearish to him without immediately reacting. He could be out at large in our home with select seated deck guests one or two at a time. And we had to work hard to get it to that point. His limitations were he couldn't have something too close unless Cho Toby chose it. Um, this was applied to dogs and humans, even known ones. Uh, Clothier has a treat and retreat exercise that allows your dog to choose to come closer and closer. And it's not just chumming the dog in. He could not um, tolerate really quick movements, even from us sometimes. Nothing could be too loud or too dramatic. And only dog savvy guests who followed instructions could be with him. A uh, cautionary example was one friend um, who moved when I was out of the room. And I had warned her, don't, you know, I, I had to go change the laundry so I can put him in another room if you like. She said, no, that's okay. I said, you need to stay seated where you are. She got distracted, saw something she wanted to take a closer look at, moved, and Toby backed her down. So that's the end of the pre uh, presentation proper. I do want to get to Q and A's. Um, I will, um, if anybody wants a list of these resources sent to them, I will um, send them to you at, by email. My contact information is at the end, but I do want to mention um, that again, Jody Herget and Dyson's Zoomy presentation on reactivity is excellent. Um, 
and there's the link to it. And I recommend for your canine in Amherst, Illinois, if you're in the Chicago area and the dog obedience group in Chicago for trainers. Um, and there you can consult these organizations for various um, ways to locate someone. Also, the position statements and handouts from the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior, which makes it clear why dominance is not something you want to apply in working with your dog. Karen Pryor's Don't Shoot the Dog book, The New Art of Teaching and Training. Uh, she's a clicker person. I can't do clickers, but she taught me the power of positive reinforcement and ignoring unwanted behavior. You can extinguish unwanted behavior in your Scotty as well as in your family members if you simply ignore behavior you don't like and positively reinforce with praise and gratitude the behaviors you do like. Oh, I don't know where that red thing came from. Um, Suzanne Clothier's book and her website. Absolutely go for these. I'm getting red marks on these things. I don't know why. Um, Torrid Rugas's books, um, a photo illustrated handbook of canine behavior and at Dunbar's Bite for um, dogs. I recommend the uh, Flower Essence Society's Five Flower for Formula and they're fear free. Um, body work for your Scotty. I mentioned this before. You can Google to find various instructions and also um, licensed professionals. Through a dog's ear or similarly calming recordings or white noise machines also are very good and that's it I <laughs> got to a uh, uh, the question and answer session so Michelle do you want to take over here these are just the uh, reminders to remain muted and enter your questions in the chat panel thank you and it's all thank you for the presentations and our presentation and helpful and fantastic and no questions so far. So if anybody has anything, uh, throw it in the chat for us. But it's a lot of uh, thank yous, and I, you know, want to want to thank you as well. This was so clear and beautifully presented, and I thought just laid out in a perfect, logical way, like taking from you know one step to the next. So great, great job. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. A couple of things I want to mention to everyone. One is just a reminder that if you'd like to make a donation to the Door County Scotty Rally to help us support um, this kind of programming, we would greatly appreciate it. Lori's got a slide for us um, that she just put up there. So thank you, Lori, for doing that. And a couple of things I forgot to mention about Lori, just because I was so excited to get her, get her going this morning, is we are very fortunate to have Lori... Um, agree to become a board member for the Door County Scotty Rally. She's been a fabulous addition to our team. Um, she is also the editor of our newsletter, um, which she puts out periodically during the course of the year and um, takes it upon herself to do a lot of writing of some great information. Um, as I mentioned before, I really think Lori is um, the closest I have ever come. There have been a few friends in my life that I consider to be a sage. And she is indeed one of those. Um, she, she exhibited her expertise so wonderfully today, Lori, so thank you. And lastly, um, a very important thing I didn't tell you about Lori is that she and her husband, Jim, um, received the uh, Braveheart Award from the Door County Scotty Rally um, in this last year was sort of given in two parts. One a year ago or, um, or a couple of years ago when we had rally, but I didn't have the award. Um, and then we acknowledged them in September and we couldn't find the award. So we finally gave it to her recently when we met up in terms of transporting a dog. But um, again, Lori, thank you so much. And Matt, it appears that we do have some questions. So I'm gonna turn some things over the program over to Matt to, mo to uh, moderate those. 
I believe. Actually, I think we're up to like 11 or 12 thank yous. And the only question that I see is, is that Nessa sitting next to you so calmly throughout the whole <laughs> No. <laughs> this is, is a doorstop. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I I see that um, Arnell asked about frequency of flower essences, and basically you want to apply those, and I you want to buy the alcohol based ones in a spray bottle, but you are not spraying them directly on your Scotty. Um, you want to spray them on your hands and apply them to the beard and sides of the face, the ears, the chest, and do it before you, if you can, before you anticipate, um, uh, if you want your Scotty to be calmer, like at going to the vet, if they're nervous about that or whatever, you can apply them. You can empty the whole bottle basically on your dog. It's not going to hurt them. So applying more often than not is a good rule. If you want to try to um, establish doing it several times a day, even under normal circumstances, I, I am always amazed at how well these things work and how well it works simply to be um, calm yourself in the presence of your dog. What you convey by your attention, your, uh, for example, dogs don't generally like you messing around with their body. Um, with Nessa, who is easy, um, but with all of my other Scotties too, I learned how to use things like not looking directly at them when I'm washing the beard, brushing the teeth, brushing them so that they know this is most of the time you take your Scotty and you look directly at them. This conveys all kinds of stressful stuff to them and it makes them uncomfortable. You want to not look directly at them when you're doing it, not look them in the eye in other words. So um, you can create an environment that suggests calm. For example, I groom all of my Scotties myself and I have, by using these techniques, I do not use a noose on my dogs. They cooperate with me and stay on the table. Um, and I pay attention to how it is for them. One of Clothier's seminars was called The Elemental Animal, and it was five basic questions. How's this for you is one of them. And if you see your dog getting starting to get stressed out, you need to do something to stop that. So flower essences, body wraps, um, Sadie responded so well to body wraps. Colleen McAuliffe taught a class in Tellington Teach Out Body Wraps where we had a number of dogs uh, who were anxious or reactive. It was a, a spread out in a large place. We each had, were instructed to bring our own little area blanket. And when we came in and got settled down, the dogs were reacting, barking, you know, things like that. And she immediately, she had instructed us in how to wrap them with a Tellington tea touch wrap. And the dogs suddenly were silent. Every wow. single dog. Um, this is like what a thunder shirt can do for some dogs. And thunder shirts and body wraps should not be used just only at, at anxious times. You want to establish a wrapping for your dog um, so that you can calm them down overall. You're trying to reduce cortisol, uh, the set point of their cortisol on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, all of these things should not be reserved for only high stress times. You need a calm and calming environment overall. Well, we do have a question here um, that I think is really interesting uh, from Wendy. My younger Scotty gets overly excited when he sees another dog that he strains on the leash. He wants to play. How is the best way to set up a play date with other Scotties off leash in a safe fenced in yard so that he can learn to play appropriately? If is, is the dog only reactive on leash, do you think? Um, is that, do you know for sure the dog is not reactive or lunging and so forth when they're on leash? This is only a, reactive no, on leash. Only, okay. This is then just, um, a, for one thing, you don't want to be a killjoy with your dog. You know, if they, they, 
it, this is not that they can't be ex happily excited, but even happy stress, even good stress, like you're excited about something can cause these hormones to rise. So what you want to do, we have play dates with various um, dogs in our neighborhood. You have to be able to introduce them by going on a walk together or something like that. You don't want to just, you know, and you have to be able to assess, yes, they are going to be able to, um, to uh, play well together. Um, and this has to be done very gradually. People in rescue know how to do this better than anybody I know. Um, Clothier also has a um, one, two, three, go say hi um, handout. She has lots of handouts on her, um, her, uh, her website that will address this, but you need to do it very, very gradually so that you can assess they are going to be okay. And initially when you go into the yard, it would be nice if it could be neutral territory, but probably it's going to be your yard or their yard. Um, but you need to assess how they're doing um, before you let them off leash. And you're paying attention to all those signals. Um, we've set up play dates with various dogs and it's always turned out really well but i'm you know paying attention to how the dog acts when they're near if your dog when it comes near the other person and wants the other dog and wants to play you're probably going to have an okay um situation but you have to take it very very gradually so that you don't end up having somebody have a misunderstanding and get hurt it is very Thank very you very difficult to to take it that sl as slowly as you should be we all are impatient i think thank you there's one final comment here with a question matt oh, from eric or i don't know if Lori can see it yeah i can I see that i was just um, reading it through this is yeah it's kind of it's a little bit longer i was just reading through it to start um yeah, go ahead, Laurie. If you're, if you're yeah, it looks like, um, okay, this is an attempt to dominate. Um, you know, there are dogs who are more dominant and, and you can read him, that's very good. Um, but it sounds like there was an injury. Um, yeah, you were distracted. This is what, you know, management always fails. This is a hard situation. Um, Henry knew by my reaction that he had messed up but there are other specific suggestions to help him is there a hope that he will literally finally grow out of this. He may not be there are certain dogs, he may not be good with and if it sounds like. Um, he can be a bully it sounds like Henry is a little bit of a bully, so I would suggest going to um, a class where you're going to be um, have training and do behavioral training or obedience training with Henry so that he can know um, there's a, a check in that you do and you may even want to go to a reactive dog class for this, where they teach you how to do check automatic check ins with your dog, where your dog can calm itself down by checking in with you, you give them a treat, and then they don't go forward with the behavior. But this is probably a situation where you want to go and have Henry in a class with other dogs under a controlled situation and have the uh, the trainer help you with this particular situation. Um, it If you're going to have to be very careful because as you said, there was a, a slight harm, it can escalate. Um, and if he's allowed to con continue to bully other younger dogs then he's going to have success that's it's fun it's fun for them to get that kind of level of excitement um so it's self-rewarding to do this kind of behavior so you need to be able to find ways to distract him uh, when you see a dog that is a potential um, problem you need to do the things where you are walking away giving him positive reinforcement so that he's 
getting a different idea about these dogs, but I would definitely, since he's par partly injured one dog, I would definitely suggest that you go and, and to a behavior class with, with him so that this doesn't escalate. escalate. Eric, one, one thing, we have two dogs and one of them is very reactive to other dogs. And one of the things that we've found that works the best is finding the most crinkly, loudest treat bag possible. Uh, because he's also very, <laughs> like food takes precedent over anything, even fighting or playing hard or whatever with other dogs. So yeah. we joke that Taylor doesn't know his name, but he knows his name is the sound of the crinkly treat bag. So if we go anywhere, yes. there's any kind of group, <laughs> group thing like that, like a dog park or whatever, you know, whatever. we have that. And, and then another thing that makes it easier is if you have um, three dogs like that, if there's one, if there's you know two of you going, have one person be with the most reactive dog and fully concentrated on that dog so that the other two have, you know, somebody watching them, but the, the reactive one, like with us, like all focus completely on Taylor the entire time yes. we're there, because yeah. if you take your eye off him for a second, he's just jetting off to go try to dominate some other dog, you know, like, just like you were talking about. So yeah. it, treat bag and, and may... really, really having the attention helps, helps a lot. It may be, uh, you know, for a while with reactive dogs or dominating dogs that group dog situations aren't the best thing um, and definitely have one human per reactive dog because you can't have two dogs and try to control one of them. It's, it's just not going to work or do for them. You want to pair the positive experience with um, them being calmer in the presence of of something that for Henry, it sounds like the stimulus is a younger dog that he thinks, oh boy, I can, I can, I can do things to this dog. And isn't that fun? Um, again, you know, there's really, although you may have to yell sometimes to interrupt a behavior, in general, you don't want that kind of reaction from yourself if you can help it. Uh, again, you know, if it's, if you, you're in a dangerous situation. You as a human have, have messed up and trust me, I've done this. I've done this myself many times. It's re very regrettable, but try to keep everything as positive as possible and what your dog responds to. Maybe the treats, I've had dog Scotties who believe it or not, were not at all treat motivated, not at all. But the toy or with Nessa, squirrel or bunny, she'll react to that. Um, she reacts very well to calming um, voice and that sort of thing. Eric had asked a question about um, any suggestions for trainers in the Madison, Wisconsin area. And one of the things I would suggest, um, and Lori, you may know specifically some things, but, you know, Patricia McConnell, who's well known um, for, for um, dog behavior issues and things like that, used to be have a weekly um, show on NPR, Wisconsin Public Radio, but she's in the M Madison area. And I know that she has had other um, therapists working with her. So you may wanna Google her. The other thing is for anybody, you can go to the Association of Professional Dog Trainers. And also there's the Animal Behavior Society. You can look at those two sites and look for yeah um, i think that's in my resources in your, yeah resources yeah. in your area and i was i was going to say that yeah, i it, thought that you had listed both of those Lori. yeah i think i listed three different options and again if anybody wants um to contact me for the list of resources this should be up uh so you can watch it and pause it on youtube but if you want to contact me i can just list give you a list of resources to send them by email um, if if you'd really like it that way um, but yeah Patricia McConnell if I I had to stop my pages of resources knowing I was going to she I uh, subscribed to her blog she is excellent she has wonderful books um, and there are so many dog wise publications is uh, dog wise is a publisher of books and they have tons and tons and tons of resources, um, DVDs, um, books, uh, access to classes, things like that. Um, so Dogwise is another major resource. Um, also, word of mouth is wonderful. If you are in uh, Scotty's circles online, ask 
on a Facebook page that you're, does anybody know? Because getting a in-person um, mm -hmm. recommendation is I've always found uh, really key. I had to do that when we needed to change our regular vet, alas, got um, a tick-borne disease and had to retire. And um, I could not find another vet that I, I liked. And I uh, called my friend, Wendy DiCarlo and, uh, of Dog Obedience Group, and she gave me an excellent recommendation. So that's to just use your, use your circle of Scotty friends to yeah. um, online or in person to get um, various uh, recommendations. Patricia's not, I just looked at her website. She's not seeing behavior cases right now, but Eric, I don't know where you are specifically, but um, a really great trainer in Wisconsin is Jody uh, Hergert Andresen that um, Lori had mentioned before. And she had done one of our Zoomies last year and she's in Oshkosh. And, um, you know, you could either travel there, but she also does consults by Zoom. So you could, um, you know, look into contacting her. I credit yeah. Jody with saving um, our second rescue dog. I think that he was probably going to end up being put down had he not come to us and had we not contacted her. Um, I think the only other thing, and I think you probably mentioned this, Lori, but if you have um, a reactive dog of any kind, it's our job really to um, set them up for success. That was probably the biggest Absolutely. lesson that Connor taught me is it, that was my job was to create a successful environment for him. And I learned very yes. quickly that it, I was much better at that than my husband, Tom was. Um, so yeah. you need to kind of take the lead. And if you're living with somebody who's going to be good at watching everything. Yeah. Yeah, I have Jody is also in the listed in the resources, yeah. um, her contact information. But she is, yeah, I was, I absolutely, I've watched her Zoomy uh, more than once. It's really good, um, and it works so well with your your Katie too, um, as you told me. We had we had done that with um, with uh, our Hemingway. He, who would sit up on the window and bark and bark and bark before I saw her Zoomy. We just, I just following Clothier's advice of don't let your dog practice bad behavior. Um, I, he was fortunately responsive to verbal, just me saying, no, 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 come on, get down. And I'd make him get down off of the top of the chair. And, or it got to the point where I could just simply say, eh, and he'd know to stop barking because he'd know he'd have to get down otherwise. And, um, but you can, Jody suggests blocking things off if you can't. Don't let them practice that kind of behavior. Similarly with the dog who was uh, bullying younger dogs, don't let them have success at that. If you see a younger dog, the kind of dog, or you see your dog's um, level react uh, beginning to rise, get them away from them. Don't let them near them. Right now they can't handle it. And that's setting them up for success as Michelle said. Well, Lori, okay. I think we've got everyone covered here. Thank you immensely from all of us. Well, it was a it was a real joy to be able to put this together and and do it. Um, I've had so much, um, so many classes and and things like that, and I've learned so much from my Scotties that I'm really glad to be able to share it, and I hope it's of benefit to the people who who need it and their dogs. So fun to see all of them too, your photos. Thank you for yes. sharing them with us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, you guys. Well, thank you again for tuning in. Um, this will be on our YouTube channel. Probably I'm going to say within um, a week, hopefully we'll get it up there. And um, I think we still have to get the, the our last one up there as well. It's been a little bit crazy time around here. Um, so you can look for that. And the other thing is, if any of you are thinking about coming to Wolf Scott, which is going to be the theme of the Door County Scotty Rally the weekend of May 20th, please get registered ASAP because um, tickets are very limited this year. We're holding um, the, the quantity of people down to a, a manageable number so that people are comfortable milling around. So I encourage you to get registered ASAP. Okay. Thanks again. 
in a ruse to all of you. <laughs> I was going to have Katie sing, but that might be ear piercing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. So Matt, can you stay on for a moment? Yes. Yeah, okay. Stop the recording. Oh, thank you. you. Stop the recording. Yeah, I'm trying. Hang on a second. Yeah. Recordings. <laughs>